Welcome to the Lift Your Story podcast with guest Miles Wakeham, known as the Financial Contrarian. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Ann. I am that gal from Milton, Ontario, Canada, and I'm with. I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. We would like to welcome you to our Lift Your Story podcast. In this episode, we have Miles Wakeham, and he is known as the Financial Contrarian. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, you're welcome. very welcome. Okay, Miles, tell us a little bit about your journey from where you started to how you got to where you are today. All right. Well, I'm originally from Australia, so that's my accent, if people are wondering. And uh, I grew up as a kid in a city of about a million people called Adelaide, which is on the south central coast. Uh, beautiful place, Mediterranean climate, vineyards, culture, all that stuff. And yet it's not a destination spot. So most people never go there. Um, so when you live, uh, live in a, what I guess we would have called a big version of a small town uh, and you grow up that way, the rules are a little different. They're not normal everyday rules. And so I went through life, I was raised early on as a musician. My mother decided to stick a violin under my chin when I was five and said, kid, you're going to play in the symphony orchestra. And by God, she was right. By the age of 12, I was in the junior symphony orchestra. Go figure. <laughs> but that doesn't get checks, right? And here is a kid, you know, going through puberty. He wants to, you know, whatever. So I ended up uh, going to high school. Um, I went to a private college, you know, one of those like suit and tie kind of Oxfordish places. And after about three years of that, I started realizing I wasn't learning squat about the world here and nothing made any sense to me at all. But my uncle, happened to be a CEO of a very large, I guess you call it an appliance uh, manufacturer, a very big company nationwide. And I did work experience when I was like about 14 or 15, something like that. And uh, he put me on the shop floor with the sales guys. And the next thing you know, I'm like learning about business and I'm learning about transactions and people and supply chain, all the stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, that's it. That's what I actually think I want to do. So uh, I went back home to my parents. And about this time, I was a bit of a nerd with uh, technology. And I'd been playing around with radios and CBs and amateur radio and stuff. And then I discovered computers. Uh, this was in 1978. Uh, when the first ever personal computers came out, I convinced my father to give me a loan to buy one. Got a part-time job throwing newspapers and stuff and bought it. And then I, I sort of put together what I'd learned with my uncle and what I'd learned with my computers. And I said, hey, there's a business in this. And so this 15 year old kid went to my parents and I said, listen, I know you kind of think I should go to college and you know, I should finish high school, but no, nah, I ain't gonna work. So I'm not gonna do this. And I wanna start a business and I need your blessing and I need you to stop paying these ridiculous <laughs> private college tuition fees. And they said, okay, kid, whatever, do it. You're on your own, but you know what? You screw up, it's on you. It's not on us. Buck stops on your desk. So I said, okay. And then from the age of 15, a kid who never finished high school, never went to college, I started businesses and it's hard to try to tell the story of what goes on from there, but I'll give you the quick summary. By about 25, I had written software for large defense contractors. I ran a $5 billion submarine contract with a, some software I wrote. Uh, I did software for large distribution shipping companies, kind of like DHL, that sort of thing. I wrote software for our state attorney general's department. I wrote software for big manufacturers, even running cryogenic freezer storage labs and universities. I mean, all this weird stuff because Back in those days, nobody knew how to program these damn computers. And all of a sudden I was the kid on riding the wave. So I did all of that. By 25, I decided that it was time for a new chapter. And one thing led to another, I ended up landing in Los Angeles. Uh, met a girl, got married, stayed here for six years, um, stumbled into a startup in Southern California uh, that was doing this weird medical stuff with something they called biotechnology, which I didn't really understand, but I thought, hey, I'll learn. Um, went into that, 
found out that it ended up becoming Amgen, the world's largest biotechnology corporation. They gave me a ton of stock options, made me a millionaire before I was 30. And um, that was stage one. I went back to Australia at 32. Uh, I was there for about five years. During that time, I got divorced. I lost pretty much all my money. I was in a major car accident, had half of my body destroyed. I uh, got out of that, uh, tried to rebuild everything back from zero again, ended up landing back in Los Angeles in 1999. Um, within five years, I made another million bucks, um, this time doing real estate. Uh, enjoyed that, moved to Phoenix. Um, then uh, by 2008, lost it all pretty much in the great financial recession, which we all in, know and love. <laughs> By about 2014, made it all back. Today, made it all back times five. Discovered Bitcoin, did all this stuff. Um, that's my story. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> Q&A I've got, time. I've got to ask you, is it true the first million is the hardest to make? Uh, depends how much help you get. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen if i was dig digging ditches having to make it yeah it'd be pretty damn hard because there's one of me a lot of ditches and you know that's that's the way it is but i, I tell you what i do learn and and i learned this being a software engineer uh, very early on is that life's about leverage if you can do something and you can have it work for you then it takes all the pressure off and at that point you get that kind of inertia and you get that natural sort of progression towards uh whatever your passion is it doesn't matter whether it's about business or money or art or politics or whatever it might be if you've got inertia because you're able to leverage you can make it pretty fast yeah yeah you know it's kind of like having the network having the contacts you know having yeah um but, okay so one thing I learned as a kid in Australia, and this might be a sort of a, a takeaway if anybody listens and pays attention to my rambles. Um, when I was a teenager uh, living on a coastal city, one of the things we always do was go surfing. And, um, you know, I was not a great surfer, but you go out with your buddies and somebody's got a VW microbus, so you throw your boards on the back and you hit the beach and you hopefully don't get eaten by sharks, but that's... <laughs> goes with the territory down there but anyway you find the beaches that have got really inter interesting waves and you start learning how to surf and you realize this thing's kicking my butt man this hurts i keep getting the board hits me in the back of the head when i fall off it and um you know it's just how this ain't fun um and then one day if you do it enough you start realizing that there's a there's a natural inertia i call them kind of universal truths uh, of the way that things work in terms of rises and falls. It happens all through every part of our existence. It's, it's embedded in the concept of uh, electricity in po you know, positive negative. It's the poles of our planet that keeps us spinning off into oblivion because we have balance between two extremes. And you start realizing it when you're a surfer out in the ocean that waves go up and waves go down. One thing that you learn very, very quickly is where to position yourself well ahead of a wave. You need to be able to understand, um, be practiced in how to surf, how to balance, how to handle that. You need to understand the waves come in sets. You need to be well ahead of them and you need to paddle like crazy well before the thing gets on you. So you've got some form of momentum. It picks you up and then you get the ride of your life. That sounds great as a surfer. Imagine paralleling that into investing or making money. And that's exactly what I've done. I don't go to, um, to coin a Canadian term, uh, skate to where the puck is going. I don't look at something that is here today. I don't look at the problems of the world today. I don't look at where things might be or where things have been as a determination of where they will. I look around me at the waves way back <laughs> behind me and I look at which one I want to punt on and I start paddling like crazy. And one day that wave picks you up and you get the ride of your life and then you get addicted to it. And that's, 
how I've done my thing. I've always looked at where things are going to be three, four, five years from now, and I punt accordingly. And it, it's always worked out well for me. Makes sense. Well, I was listening to your podcast. Uh, you don't own things, things own you. Right. Which I, I was very interesting. And, and you're, you talked about the reptilian brain and the Hummer. And I mm -hmm. thought that was a, uh, was a great analogy. Can you expand on that a little bit for the people that haven't heard that? Yeah, um, just before 9-11 happened, before the turn of the millennia, um, we had the military buying large scale quantities of um, assault vehicles, or I guess you call them uh, Jeeps or the equivalent of that, from a company called Hummer, which eventually I think was taken over by General Motors. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the process of doing it, they had this massive stockpile of these vehicles. And um, when 9-11 occurred, it changed the psychology of most people in the Western world. We all felt ourselves to be vulnerable at once because let's face it, the US hadn't been attacked on its shores uh, for a very, very long time. And all of a sudden it found itself in that position. That sort of psychology and that psychosis forced a lot of people to make decisions about how they lived their life, that they wanted things that were erring on the side of caution and safety and so on. And a, a psychologist out of France, which I cannot remember his name, but I'll, I'll call him the psychologist out of France, was hired by General Motors at this point in time to study uh, or to, to uh, consult with them on something he had discovered called the reptilian brain. The idea was that when people, based on all of our heritage back to the days of caveman, when we were faced with threat, we would do certain predictable things. We would always err towards safety uh, and caution. And he had discovered that the, um, particularly in the American psyche, and this was a, a psyche built on hundreds of years of um, fear, fear of we're escaping from Mother England. We're fighting against our, uh, to build up our own existence. We're being threatened at all times. We need to build up our, our war chest, our, our, our strength that comes from our ability to support that. Um, if you parallel that with countries that have never gone through any form of sort of internal rebellion, civil war, attack from outside and so on, it's a very, very different story. But in the United States, there was a propensity towards fear-based purchasing. And what they had done at that time is they'd realized that we could take this stockpile of Hummers, we could turn them into urban vehicles, we could repackage them, and we convinced the average soccer mom to spend $55,000 to buy a vehicle that was too big, took way too much gas to run it, and they couldn't park it at the mall anywhere they, they tried, and yet they did it. And by using psychology, we created a situation in which those very consumers were effectively sort of, I don't know, um, scammed, <laughs> not scammed, but manipulated into doing something that was against their own self-interest. The whole concept of consumption and consumerism, for the most part, if you look at it from a simple humanity, hum, human perspective, is to do something against your own best interest. You might find going to the mall that you want to go and buy that dress or that watch or that whatever. But the reality is you're actually having to serve a need of void that is within you to fill it with an artificial stimulus. And if you understand that, you start realizing that you don't own the things that you buy, they own you. And that was the purpose of that particular episode. Yeah, it's, I can remember when the, those Hummers came out. Just like you said, they showed them in Beverly Hills. All the celebrities, all the stars had them. It was a it was a status symbol. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, if if you live in a city of um, like a, the city of Phoenix, where I live, is five million people, and it has a reasonably decent freeway architecture. But if I go off road on just on the surface streets, that ain't the vehicle I should be driving. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's for sure. You know, and you talked about uh, not being in debt. And just from my personal experience, I learned once I got out of debt, 
is so freeing because you, you, you have freedom because you don't have to worry about, well, I've got this payment I'm going to make. I've got this. So, you know, and of course I was always kind of a, if I didn't like the job I had, I'd quit and go somewhere else. I was just that way. But once I got that freedom, I was really, I was even worse about that. Cause if I didn't like it, I'm out of here because I wasn't going to lose anything. And, and, yeah. and people think they don't make, you know, I don't make that much money, but then when you don't have all that debt, the money you make goes a long way because you keep it all. Well, the other thing that happens is your value system changes. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you can imagine, and this is something that I've always had a hard time getting my head around, particularly as an immigrant coming to a, a, a bigger country that's far more vast and, and, and far more opportunities than where I came from. But at the same time, I came with that, you know, kind of show me attitude that like simple little kid from Adelaide kind of attitude. And I, I still have that to this day. I, I question social mantra as a normal daily thing. Uh, my daughter is 24, about to be 24. And she went through the college experience and she came to me at the end of the first four years of a business degree and said, dad, what should I do with my life? And I said, well, that's what you should do with your life. <laughs> um, I believe that we lack purpose. And the only way that we find that purpose is to challenge ourselves in places which are unusual, maybe don't speak your language, maybe don't, um, they challenge your inner ability to problem solve and be pragmatic. And we don't have enough of that. We live in a very cushy life where everything's served to us by robots and Amazon. And we don't really challenge ourselves to find out who we really are. What we do in that world, and I, and I don't blame parents because I'm a parent, but I think parents aren't advising kids with their truths, the real truths. If you're, if you're retiring, you're at say, I don't know, let, let's say an arbitrary age of 65 years old, you all of a sudden find yourself in a situation where all of your, say the last 40 years or so of your working life, you've saved money, you've stockpiled things away. And all of a sudden money no longer becomes a um, barrier. It no longer becomes an impediment because you're not worried about it as much anymore. You've got your 401k or IRA or whatever you've done. Um, then your mind moves to other things. You, you want to travel, you want to, do all of the, the bucket list, right? You want to do that stuff. The problem I have, and this is, and I'm not being um, negative, I'm just being challenging, is that when, if you look at it in reverse, you look at an 18 year old kid today who goes to their parents and goes, you know, mom, dad, what should I do? And they're sitting around the kitchen table and in front of them is some sort of a university college contract. It's a debt contract right? They're going to sign up for $100,000 plus of debt at the age of 18, and they cannot yet answer the sentence, I am going to do dot, 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 dot with my life. Because they might say that, but they've never challenged that. Then they've tried it. They think they want to be a doctor. Great. Have you ever tried being a doctor? Do you know how stressful that is? If they experience that, they might not want to be a doctor. And at that point, signing this debt contract is ridiculous. I, I, um, I say, look, a kid who is not legal in most states in the United States to buy a beer at a bar has no right sitting in front of a $100,000 debt mortgage, right? No right. The kid needs to go out and become an adult and learn what that is. And for me, that was to break my shackles and to travel and to find out in the world who I was, what really I wanted to be. And that experience isn't happening. What happens is the kids that, that just go into the college and they do their thing and they get out at the other end and they find it's tougher to get a job than they thought. And maybe they don't know squat and they think they do because they've got a degree in sociology or whatever, but that ain't going to help them. So they're flipping burgers, right? So they're starting off at the mail room like we all had to do, right? Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, the kid is going to accelerate themselves because the challenge of, I want to get my apartment. I got to pay rent. I got to pay for my car. I got to pay for my phone. I got to, you know, all this stuff. 
um, all of a sudden they're like, I don't even get a chance to think anymore about who I am. I've just got to hustle and work and pay these bills and get through it. And maybe somebody, you know, I might get lucky and invest on GameSpot, uh, GameStop or something. And maybe I'll make a trillion dollars because I saw some kid on YouTube do that. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, no. The reality is you're not going to be that. You're going to end up working your guts out and not knowing who you were because that little glimmer of chance that you had before you went into college, you didn't take it. And so now, how do you fill the void of a lack of meaning as you go through you know, the building chapter of your life where you're building a family and a house and a career and all this stuff? And then you go to that next chapter, that optimization where you're saving up for your retirement. You're doing all of this, but you never knew why. There was never meaning right? Because you're just doing it because everyone else told you to do it or you had to do it because you're heavily geared. geared. To your point about debt, we sell our future out and we don't ever question that. We just do it because society told us to. Dad and mom told me to go to college. You know, it's like, no, how about you take some control of you and you fit it to you, not the other way around. If you do that, you might have a chance here, but don't fill the void with retail therapy and spending more money and buying the boat you don't need and all this other stuff because you don't know what your purpose is and you don't have meaning. Job one, find that. Job two, work out how to make money from it. That's it. Yeah. It's interesting, Mark. My oldest son, when he was on maybe 15, you know, you know, and he goes, boy, I'm glad when I get grown so I can do what I want to just, you know, whenever I want to and all that stuff. I go, yeah, well, good luck with that. Let me know how it works for you. So <laughs> fast forward, he gets out of college and, you know, of course, here he's, you know, he gets a job. He's an engineer. So he starts working right out of college and he's the one that goes, you know, I'm not sure I, I'm going to, I don't really like engineering. Aha. Uh -huh. I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah. I said, well, yeah. So you spent seven years of college to become an engineer, and now you don't want to be an engineer. He said, well, I still want to sit and do this, that, you know. And, and so I said, well, <clears throat> what, are, you know, what are you going to do? So well, I'm not sure yet. So now he's married. His kids start to have kids, the house, the, you know, the treadmill, right? Mm -hmm. and so he's one day I'm over there and he's talking about, Oh gosh, I got this, I got this. I can't, I don't have time to do this. I, get, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're grown up now. You're an adult. You can do whatever you want to, whenever you want to. Remember? Shut up, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't want to come across like I'm not as uh, insensitive to somebody's plight when they're stuck in that situation. But what I will say is, we all as individuals have a responsibility to ourselves to challenge social mantra and to make it fit our narrative rather than being an actor on somebody else's screenplay, right? We need to write our own. And the thing is that we need to learn how to do that. And that takes time and it takes, um, get, it's to go back to my surfer analogy, you'll never learn to be a great surfer if all you do is sit on the sand watching everyone else having fun out there. The reality is in life, you've got to get wet. You've got to go out there and you've got to do something and you've got to let it tell you and give you evidence that will allow you to determine who you are, who you want to be. If you can find that, and it doesn't have to be a lifelong decision. It could be something that lasts 10 or 20 years. But if you can find that, then you might have some hope at not deferring all of the things that you wanted to do in your life towards your latter quarter, the quarter with your bad back and the hip replacement. You don't want that. You want to be able to do those things early when you can enjoy them. I was uh, recently in Mexico last um, two, two weeks ago. We spent a lot of time in Mexico. I, I, I enjoy that place immensely. And I met a guy who was from Britain happened to own the Airbnb we were staying at and a, a wonderful guy, absolutely wonderful guy. And he was telling me his story. He said, Oh, you know, it just so happens I spent 10 years of my life living in Sydney and Melbourne and Australia working in the financial industry. I said, is that your career? He says, yeah, I spent, you know, 20 years in finance. 
So it made a lot of money. It was really good. I said, so why are you here in San Miguel de Allende in central Mexico? There's not much finance going on here. He goes, no, well, I realized after doing it for like 20 odd years that I hate it. I'm like, oh, really? All right, take a number. Because you and everybody else in this town have exactly the same story to tell. So I said, well, what, what did you find? What is your purpose? He goes, I love nature. So I went and bought this uh, house or an estate somewhere on the Pacific coast, north of Puerto Vallada, about an hour up in, in effectively where the jungle meets the ocean. Mm -hmm. And he's just, he, he hikes, he bicycles, he, he became part of this 3,500 population community. He bought this beautiful home on the ocean and he, and he goes and he fishes and he surfs and he swims. And he's, he's like, I could never have been happier in my life. And I said, well, looking back now, having a career in finance, did any of that help you? He goes, no. He said, I could have bought this place for 35,000 because it's cheap. And I wouldn't ever, I don't care about money. Money, in fact, is the antithesis of what I want in life. And I thought this guy's story is sort of a story that needs to be reaffirmed in all of us. Because again, he followed in this case, the UK's version of the social mantra, you know, probably went to the London School of Economics and probably became this, you know, big wonky finance guy. And then he's sitting in front of a computer with charts all day going, why am I here? <laughs> this is our story as a society. And until we are willing to be at real and to challenge it and to question the mantra and unfortunately, this mantra is sold to us by the Banking Services Commission because, uh, industry because they want our money until we are 65 to, you know, to go and play their casino with it so we get very low-level yield on it. But that's how that industry works. We've got a government that is selling out uh, its assets and its future like it's a drunken sailor with an American Express card. And all of these things together are becoming the social cultural norm, it reaffirms all the things that we as a society should not be doing. And yet we look to our elected leaders and watch them do it and go, well, it's okay for them to go and, you know, spend a $6 trillion, but it's good enough for me to go and buy the ATV. No. Well, you know, when I was in school, high school, we had like a, they called it career day where they would have people from industry come in and talk to you about you know, I work for AT&T, we do this. I work for General Motors, we do this. You know, and it would be interesting now because our education system in the United States needs to be overhauled, in my opinion. But yep. that aside, it would be nice to have somebody like that come in and go, hey, look, you know what? I work in the corporate world. I do this now. I wish I would have done this in the first place. Just right. to give people a different perspective of you don't have to go to college. You don't have to work for the, a number uh, a 500 corporation. If you like the water, you want to be a scuba diver, surfer, then mm -hmm. maybe you ought to go buy your place there and have an Airbnb and, and you know, you can still do what you want to do and have your money too. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up the question about the Hummer and the concept of marketing psychosis. When you think about uh, any situation like that, and you're looking at options, you also have to question like what's in it for them? Like, you know, where's the bias? And the truth is that the, the university education is funded by banks who are funded by student loan debt. And without that sort of un, un, unholy alliance, if you want to call it that, um, the reality is that the universities would probably be far more efficient and teach more if they were left to stand on their own two feet and have something to actually offer that had efficacy and was of value. Um, when they don't have that because they're being bolstered by money from the federal government and banks, they're allowed to go off and spin into whatever they want. And that's become our tertiary education. So we, we need to realize that it's all about that debt contract on the kitchen table for the kid. And that's determining the path forward. Well, if you know who the players are there, it's the banking industry for the most part. And if you know that the banking industry wants to get you committed to a debt that will take you 10 plus years to pay off, only to roll into the next debt, which would be a mortgage on a house, 
then you start understanding the literal translation of the word mortgage, which do you know what that is? Yeah, you're selling yourself. But somebody owns no, it. Right? It's a French term and mortgage in its literal translation equals death contract. Mort is dead and the, the rest of it is contract. It's a contract designed for you to make the uh, financial services industry wealthy with interest until the day you die. That is its intent. And it's openly stated as that. It's just hidden in French translation. What we need to realize is that we need to go against that. You're mentioning about breaking free of debt. Absolutely. However, you're breaking free of more than that. You're getting your life back. Yes. So, Miles, how can our listeners reach out to you? Well, my ramblings are easily found on the internet at a website called beunconstrained.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that, they can subscribe to my weekly podcast, which I do, where I talk and wax philosophically about these things. And uh, they will also find me if they do a YouTube search on my name or anything to do with that. Um, some great things coming up uh, for me. I have a book coming out. Uh, it's not yet out. It's, uh, God, I underestimated <laughs> the amount of work it takes to do that. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, so I will have a book on what I call fin financial sustainability, which is a methodology that people can use to avoid all of these traps we've been talking about. And the uh, other part is uh, I have a course on rental real estate, which was actually the main technique I used to break free of a nine to five job and all of those shackles. And uh, I tell my entire 25 year story in that course uh, as well. So these things will be coming out shortly, um, but everyone can find me over at beunconstrained.com and uh, I, hope, I hope they do. Right. Would you be interested in coming back in the future yeah. after your book comes Any out? Anytime you want, not a problem at all. Perfect. Because I, I like to let, I'd like you to come back after your book comes out. We can catch up on your book and what's happening from now to then. Wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Great. Well, thanks for being with us. It was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, and I really enjoy your podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit us at lifterstory.com.